Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us. It's seven o'clock, so we'll get started. Um, my name is Kate McCarthy. I'm the chair of the Montpelier Development Review Board. Tonight is June 7th, and this is a hearing of the City of Montpelier DRB. Uh, thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. I hope it's cool wherever you are sitting. Um, though, regardless of that, we will try to make this a, a comfortable experience um, and an efficient one that also gives people a chance to be heard. So um, what I would like to do is introduce the other DRB members and others who are here helping us this evening. Um, and then we'll we'll move on to the move through the agenda. So I introduce myself. Um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Abby White. Thanks, Abby. And Rob Goodwin is a DRB member. Hello, oh, Rob. And Jean Leon is also a DRB member. Hello. Hi, hi Jean. And Hello. then Michael Lazorczak is the other member of the DRB hearing um, applications and appeals this evening. Good evening. And Kate, I apologize for missing the last meeting without telling you. These things happen. I was not present either, but we we collectively appreciate your mentioning it. <laughs> and it's good to have you here. Um, and we're staffed this evening by Meredith Crandall, our zoning administrator, whom many of you know. Hi, Meredith. Um, as well as Mike Miller, the city's planning director. Hey there, Mike. Uh, we're being recorded. Orca Media is recording this evening. Good night in TV. Uh, good evening out there in TV land. Um, and we have our minutes taken by our recording secretary, Tammy. So with that, um, welcome. And I will turn it over next to Meredith to review our procedures in this remote environment. All right. So first things first. If it's noisy and there's weird background noise, let me know because we do have the ACs all got put in in the building so I can turn it off if I need to. Um, all right, I'm going to share screen. Um, so this is a you know, run through largely for people who are viewing um, Orca from home, but we do have some people who I think are fairly new to the Zoom board hearing procedures. Um, so I'm going to go through in a little more detail on some of those procedures than I have been lately when we haven't really had members of the public present. Um, all right, so for those viewing this meeting via Orca Media, you can participate in the DRB meeting via the Zoom platform. You can use this link here and I'll leave this up on the screen for a little bit. Um, sorry, I've got somebody emailing me about trying to get in. <laughs> which goes to the, if you're having problems accessing the meeting, email me here. Uh, you can also call this number here. Um, uh, Mike, if I send you uh, Steve's email, can you email him the link? Mike Miller. Oh, Mike's still there. Um, I'll get to it in just a minute. Uh, all right, um, so there's that. Um, da, 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 da. If anybody's in the meeting is having difficulty accessing the video conferencing features, then please chat, use the chat function in Zoom to talk to me about that. Um, the meeting is being recorded as well as streamed live via Orca Media, of course. Um, turning on your video is optional. All public testimony will be taken verbally. Um, please reserve the chat function for just those troubleshooting or logistics problems, um, although the chat will be added to the public record if it's used. Please keep your microphone on mute when you are not speaking. This reduces background noise. Um, if anyone is participating by phone, we don't tonight have anybody doing that, but if anybody does um, who calls in, you can use star six to let you mute or unmute and that lets everybody on Zoom see that as well. Um, if there's anybody attending who's interested in speaking on a particular matter, and right now I know who those people are, but you can do this separately. Um, when you're ready to speak, please raise your hand. You can do that physically if you're using the video function, or you can use the raise hand button on your toolbar. Um, for anybody who's call, who calls in on the phone, you can press star nine, and this will do a little raise hand in our Zoom feature so that we can see that. Um, if for some reason none of those options are working for you, Feel free to unmute yourself during a pause in the discussion and, and state your name. When you do are recognized by the chair, 
Please unmute your microphone, confirm that you can be heard, and make sure to provide your full name and address for the record. Um, this is for those people who are commenting as interested parties, not necessarily applicants, as we know who you are and what your addresses are. Um, if you do make comments on a matter, we're going to ask that you please keep those comments to two minutes. Um, board members will then have the opportunity to respond to your comments or ask questions of you. Um, and the applicant may also have an opportunity to respond. The chair might grant additional time for speakers who have follow up questions or comments. Um, and when you're done speaking, we ask that everybody mute their microphones again. Um, you know, you can, if you speak and you have comments and then later you have further comments on something that you didn't know about or is just something later in the agenda, you will have the opportunity to speak again, but please wait until the chair recognizes you. In the event the public is unable to access this meeting, it will be continued to a time and place certain. Um, if anyone is having connectivity issues, try turning off your video or closing other applications on your phone or computer. Um, and for anybody who is trying to, oh, hold on, get to the meeting packet materials, um, you can download them using this link. This is both for those at home and anybody who um, did not pull the meeting packet prior to the meeting um, or is having problems seeing the share screen, you can get everything that we're looking at that was submitted prior to tonight's hearing on the city website. Please note that all votes taken during this meeting will be done by roll call vote. And I will now hand the meeting back over to the chair. Very good. Thank you, Meredith. All right. Uh, what we will do next, our next item on our agenda is the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as printed? So moved. Motion by Abby. Is there a second? Second the motion. Second by Jean. Thank you. I'll call the roll. Uh, Jean. Yes. Michael. Yes. Abby. Yes. Rob? Yes. And I vote yes as well. We have approved the agenda. Thank you. Um, comments from the chair. I'll, ju I'll just say briefly, um, this applies to all applications and I will say it again, but just to be, just to say up front, um, I want to let folks know that during the time that we've been conducting business on Zoom, we've done all of our deliberations in a closed session. Um, it's helped us reach better decisions. It's helped us interact more effectively given the sometimes awkwardness of the Zoom environment. And I want to um, confirm and assure people that we've been doing this for all applications, whether simple or complex. So when you see your application voted into deliberative session, it's not a reflection on your application. It's the process that we have been using. We issue a written decision as soon as possible after the hearing concludes to keep things moving along. So I wanted to share that so that people are not surprised. The next item on the agenda is our minutes. Um, we do not have enough people here who were in attendance at the May 17th meeting to vote on those minutes. Um, so I'd like to move those to our next meeting, please. Okay, very good. So that brings us to our first item of business, which is 393 Gould Hill Road review construction of a new barn on steep slopes. Um, so the way that we're going to do this, uh, just to get a little more specific about the overview that Meredith provided, is I will swear in the witnesses, who anyone who wants to talk on the application. Meredith will give an overview. I'll turn to the applicant, Justin McCabe, for an over, a brief overview and anything that he wants to add. Um, and then typically what we do is we walk through the staff report, which highlights items for discussion. And we focus especially on those items where that merit more discussion um, and less on those that don't. So that's where we're headed. So with that, um, in addition to the applicant, is anyone here to be heard on this application? All right, in that case, um, Justin, what I will have you do please is raise your right hand um, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Thank you very much. So I'll turn to Meredith for a brief overview of the application. Thank you, Kate. Um, as you said, this application is for construction of a barn on steep slopes. 
and that's the reason this is here before the board. Um, there's really for the board's determination, it's really focused on the steep slopes um, and how that interacts with the erosion control and stormwater provisions. That's really the main issue here before the board. Um, and there were some specific comments on um, the EPSC and site plan from the Department of Public Works that I flagged for the board. Um, and it really, the, the crux of it, it would be on page eight of the staff report where there are some potential um, conditions of approval for the board to take a look at, um, where we just wanna make sure that all the erosion controls that need to be in place are in place um, and that stormwater isn't being directed off the parcel. Um, but the, the good thing is here in this situation, we're dealing with slopes that go towards the back of the parcel itself. We're not worried about stormwater going into the street or anything like that. Um, but those, they are some things to take a look at. Okay, thanks Meredith. Um, so next I'll turn to Justin, welcome. Uh, would you like to give us a, tell us a little bit about your project? Yeah, uh, thank you so much. And thank you all for your service. Um, really appreciate being here tonight. Um, I'm actually gonna try a little screen share here um, sure. and see if I can make that work. Um, I'm, a very, I'm a visual person, so I think it makes it a little bit easier. Can folks see my screen? Yes. Perfect. So so this is the barn, this is a rendering of the barn that I'm, I'm envisioning um, having built on my property. Um, you can see this dark gray line right here is the um, is the my driveway representation of my driveway. Um, the barn itself is about 28 by 35 um, in total. It's a timber frame barn built by Timber Homes of Vermont just down the road on Elm Street. Um, and the slope we're dealing with is right on the front. Um, so this is a, a, a call it a three story structure in essence. So there is a drive in portion on the bottom, which I can rotate this around to see. So that's a drive-in portion where um, I hope to put a tractor um, <laughs> for our property. Uh, the main level here is actually where cars will park um, our cars, and then the top will be a workshop um, for myself. Um, though we're using the natural topo topography of the land as it sort of sit, as it sits right now um, to um, to do the structure and to, and to really get these three levels out of it. Um, this slope here is not representative of the actual slope on the property it's actually a little bit steeper and this again is just a representation sort of what we're dealing with um but this is the primary reason we're here before the board today um this slope does ex exist naturally today um so we're using that natural contour um as part of the barn design um the two there were two issues um that were brought up um by the um, dpw um when they had reviewed the plans um, one was the location of the silt barrier. Um, Don Marsh um, and Grenier, um, I can't remember the their, rest of their name, but um, had done these plans for me, the erosion control plans. The initial silt barrier, can you see the silt barrier drawings now? I can. Can others? Yes. Okay. I didn't know if it switched or if I had locked it onto that um, <laughs> Google, Google SketchUp. Um, the original silt barriers were very close to the back um, edge of the barn. Um, he moved them out um, at DPW's request um, and then noted that the, the construction contractor will have to move these periodically as they're getting in and out of that area um, and doing the foundation work. So um, this was the first, first piece of their request. Uh, the second part of their request was the, um, the drains, the um, drainage around the barn. The initial drainage had two outlet pipes, um, one sitting where the present one is, and then another coming along this side of the property, which would be closer to Steve um, and Irina Gold's property mm -hmm. um, to the south um, area. Um, now we've circled it around at DPW's request such that it's further away um, from the boundary line um, from Steve and Irina. And there is actually um, a mound um, septic system here as well. So there's actually, a, there will be a pretty good diversion um, for any stormwater coming out or drainage coming off of the barn um, in that back area. Um, the other thing I wanted to note um, as part of the disclosure is um, we initially submitted a set of engineering plans, uh, foundation plans with this. 
um, and stamped plans. Um, I'm talking with our uh, contract, our concrete contractor, um, Scott Hutchins. Um, he was not enamored with how they were, were set up. So he and the engineer are working together to, um, there's a lot of structural steel in it and they, they're they redesigning it. So there will be a new set of engineered plans, stamped engineered plans um, as part of the final package. Um, but that's currently under under review right now as part of this project. So okay. um, with that, I'm happy to sort of answer any questions that folks have. Well, thanks. Thanks, Justin. Maybe we can get back to seeing each other when you're done sharing your screen. There we go. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would ask just one quick question off the bat. Um, when the foundation plans are, re do the two different foundation plans have any different impacts on the way the slope is modified? No, no, they will not. It has to deal with whether the, the they're doing different types of footers at the mm -hmm. front of the barn to hold the bank back on the driveway. Um, so the original one used a lot of structural steel I, this, is, this is what I've been told. This is a little third hand here, but used a lot of structural steel, which made it very hard for Scott's team to get in there and work. Mm -hmm. And this is going to use more of a stepped foundation, which I guess is also another traditional method um, to retaining the bank um, and making sure that nothing happens on the driveway and to the barn itself. But otherwise, all the excavation, the amount of excavation, everything else will be exactly the same. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, well, typically what we'll do, we'll do is just head through the staff report, but before we do, do any um, any DRB members have, have questions about the presentation so far? All right, so let's move on to the staff report. Um, I'm, I'm just going to walk through it. So um, we, we start by looking at the general standards and the steep slopes are one portion of the general standard. But before we get to those, there are some kind of basics that we want to confirm are, are met. And those are the use standards. The single family dwelling and the accessory structure are allowed uses in this district. And those uses meet the dimensional stand, the requirements for the dimensions, the setbacks, the size of the lot, the accessory structures meet those two. There are no changes. Um, yes, so, so those are all met. Um, riparian areas, something that we look at, and in this case there is a stream um, on the parcel, a map stream, and you can see that on page five of the staff report. Um, the barn proposed structure is outside the 50-foot setback that is required, so um, that stream is um, avoided and, and meets the regulations. Um, there, what, regarding wetlands and vernal pools, it's not applicable. They're not present on the site. So I'll pause there. Um, those are the basic general standards. Uh, do DRB members have any questions about those? All right, great. So that'll bring us into section 3007, which is the steep slopes that bring us here this evening. Um, so it sounds like this um, impacts 509 square feet of steep slopes that are over that 30%. Correct. All right, okay. Um, so just a reminder to folks, we do this to protect public safety and property, including neighboring properties. Um, make sure that runoff and flooding and water quality are not uh, exacerbated or damaged. Um, and so we have, we have this hearing requirement and then we also have the plans we've reviewed as part of the requirement and the standards that we need to go through to make sure they're met. So um, as Meredith noted and the applicant noted, we received comments from DPW, the Department of Public Works. Um, and so maybe, maybe we just, we, we've talked about the silt location, we've talked about the drain line. Um, it's noted that there isn't a grading plan submitted or a before and after, slopes before, slopes after. Um, could, could you tell us a little bit about, just describe how the slope is going to change? So this, the slope around, or the so, where the barn is actually going to be constructed, it will be basically impounded with a with the concrete foundation. Mm -hmm. On the outside of the barn, we'll actually be using the natural topography again, so it should look very similar to the original slope. Um, 
on the periphery. Okay. Okay. Um, great. We, we often do require a before and after with topos. And I think there, there's kind of a before in the, um, in the slope in part of in the slopes plan or we, we might ask if you would consider a condition um, to include a, a before and after slopes plan as as a condition of the of the permit sure okay yeah. thank you yeah. and and this is fresh we we asked the same of another applicant four weeks ago <laughs> so, yeah. I'm just yeah. Saying, yeah understand yeah. yeah like i said i don't expect it to change and i don't know i mean the the distance the from the drive top of the driveway to the bottom of the slope is we're really only talking about a 20 foot travel yeah total so it's 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 i don't know we will actually tell on on the plan but we'll do it for sure okay okay thanks um okay so that kind of covers the recommendations or comments from dpw so um if it pleases the board i think we should move through the standards for sleep, steep slopes Shall we? Okay, and I just like to go through these in some detail. Um, so forgive the reading, but I think it's important to be thorough. So um, the first standard is to limit the amount of disturbance, the clearing of existing natural vegetation and impervious surface in order to minimize the potential for erosion, stormwater runoff, flooding and water quality impairment. And what we received in our materials is that this will actually improve erosion control and. How is, how is that going to do that? So it's a, it is a fairly steep slope. And so my driveway actually comes off Gould Hill Road, good Gould Hill Road, um, a significant amount. Um, so the current water travel actually comes across my driveway and down the slope and washes. So the vegetation that is there and it's been there since you know we moved in is not sufficient really to control what's happening on the edge of my driveway. Um, mm -hmm. as it stands. And so this will actually buttress where the water is currently going and then actually give it a direction because the water will flow basically into the front of the barn, then into the drainage and then around and down through on the back side. So it actually it should improve erosion around the side of the um, on the side of that property. Okay. I'm trying to picture that. Um, Originally, I thought if we if we put a barn where the water usually goes, the water might go faster in other directions and create deeper channels, say, on either side of the barn. But what I'm hearing you say is that the water is the barn is designed to take on water and drain yes. it out. Right. It's going to come right to the front. And then the whole barn is like support is going to be supported with gravel underneath mm -hmm. as well as the concrete foundation. And it'll come in to the front, grab the drainage pipes and then go around the side, whereas currently right now it, it comes around the switchback because mm -hmm. it's about um, an eight percent and my eight percent grade going up to the Gould Hill Road, and so it comes down pretty quick and carves out. Mm -hmm. And I'm usually having to throw more fill on and trying to redirect it into different channels because it's um, it gets going pretty quick. Okay, well, thanks. Any questions about that? Don't let me do all the talking, everybody. Um, the next standard is to preserve distinctive natural features, the general topography of the site and the existing natural vegetation. Um, and the testimony is that that will be maintained, including a nearby red maple. And you described too how the, how the barn will uh, maintain the topography in terms of the um, hill to either side of it that it's built into. Okay. Um, maintain or reduce the pre existing rate and retain the pattern of stormwater runoff leaving the property. And this is where DPW's comment comes in. Um, and the redirection is, or the redesign is such that less stormwater would be leaving the property than in the original design. It's going to be about the same as it is today. And, and as you said, it would be, it will not necessarily retain the pattern, but it will maybe even improve the pattern. Right, there should be less flowing onto the Steve and Irina's property um, okay. direct, as a direct director anyway, he'll have a chance to absorb before it gets there. Okay, um, produce a final grade that's compatible with the surrounding natural terrain. It's something you've described. 
create a harmonious transition between graded slopes and the natural terrain. I think that's something you've described. And then the, um, avoid creating continuous unbroken slopes or linear slopes. Um, will there be any new linear slopes created? So no, so that's why the rendering is actually a little bit of a misnomer, right? Because it looks okay. like a very linear trajectory. What will happen is it'll follow the, the current slope, which is fairly steep at the beginning, and then trail out um, just as it does today. So there'll be there'll be a minimum of two slopes. Okay. <laughs> if not more, two distinct okay. slopes. Distinct slopes. Okay. Questions from board members about that. Rob? Yeah, so obviously, um, you know, it's kind of like a cookie cutter here and whatnot. We're just taking the foundation and cutting out the slope and filling it with a barn. Um, but during construction, could, do you have any idea from your contractor or from the builder about plans for sort of like uh, where equipment will be staged, if there's any like temporary excavation of the slope that's going to be needed um, and then replaced? Um, you know, I just, if you could shed a little light on that plan, if you have any info. You know, Rob, I, I, I actually don't. I'm sorry. I don't have a, an idea of how much they're going to have to remove before they can put it in. Um, I know they're planning on doing all the work from the driveway. That's okay. their that's their current plan is they're going to try to do yeah. it all from the driveway because of getting down to the bottom of that would, would run across my septic and do all sorts of other stuff. And so they're very concerned about trying to be down there. So they're they're going to try to be up there they may have to stage some fill or what have you um but I, I just don't know those details sorry no i think that makes sense and that's a that's enough information so thank you okay great thanks rob other questions at this point all right we'll continue um the next standard is to contour contour graded slopes by varying the slope increment to produce final grade that undulates both vertically and horizontally and this has been described as a goal of the project um, so that it's not just a steep this or a steep that, it's, it's, it's more natural. Very cut and fill banks and terraces to produce a final grade that has visual interest and allows for naturalistic landscaping. Um, and what we've read is that it's too small an area for terracing to really be a part of it. Um, but it says that integrating the structure and landscaping to fit the rest of property will be completed. Um, can you admit that I, I didn't see the details on the landscaping? Could you just say very briefly what, what that will include and, and whether that has additional stormwater erosion control benefits? Um, so it, won't, it probably won't include much, honestly, Kate, the, because the original trees are so close. So there's a red maple and there's a couple of elm trees that are also part of the project that were, or ash, me, ash trees that are, the barn is kind of sliding right in between them. Mm -hmm. So it'll fill in with, you know, the natural grasses and everything else that fill in here will probably plant, but it's mostly going to be those trees um, that we'll keep. So okay. until such time as they don't, you know, don't make it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any concern about impacting the roots of those trees during the excavation process or how you might protect them? So I, I've talked with Scott. I mean, we, we've set up um, the barn. Like he's like, we're sufficient distance away from the red maple. We're sufficient distance away from the ash trees. Like he really feels like we've kind of got a sweet spot. Um, and we sized it that way too, to kind of keep that in that spot. So, um, good. That's good for sure construction. They, they get to stay. So that's, that's, that's good. The best part. <laughs> that's good. Good for the barn too. Barn's foundation. Gene, did you uh, have well, a question? You, uh, you answered my question. I know you, you had brought that up in the in the casual overview um, about the vegetation and the landscape and keeping those trees. And, and so you asked the same question I was about to ask, uh, Kate. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I should have let you do it. Um, all right. Um, so the next standard is to consider the use of retaining walls and terracing rather than cut and fill banks. And it sounds like the foundation of the lower story of the barn is effectively a retaining wall. Right, exactly. Okay. okay. A few more standards here. Um, vary the pad elevations on sites with multiple structures um, to follow the natural terrain. Um, this isn't, doesn't have multiple structures, but the, the different floors kind of behave as different structures in different areas of the slope. 
um, and it will fit into the bank. Um, the roads and drives is not applicable. Multi-story building is being constructed. And then the split or multi-level building form that step up or down the slope, indeed, that is why we are here. So um, those are the design standards. And then and Meredith did um, highlight for us about whether we wanted to get additional clarity on the linear slopes design standard. And we talked a little about that, Meredith. Is there anything else that was on your mind about that criterion? Not really, no. Okay, okay. Um, we talked about the official grading plan showing existing and proposed slopes. I'd like to get DRB members takes on um, the utility of that um, for uh, public works benefit, for record keeping. Um, what do folks think? I think that's a good idea just to see um, if, if how much the slope would be impacted change from before to after. Yeah, the before and after condition is, seems pretty reasonable. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I think I, I would be inclined to say the same thing because I feel like I'm usually one that does say this. I, I think that this application is actually, uh, you know, you use the cookie cutter analogy, <laughs> um, very, um, you know, different than the pre previous ones we reviewed of similar type. And because of, you know, if you were to draw a map of proposed contours of this, you wouldn't be drawing any contours. All you would be doing was showing that was showing the building just because of um, there's no actual, you know, grading or filling um, per se. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think I remember a previous application where there was a kind of retaining wall and there were backfilling behind it um, mm -hmm. and whatnot. And it was very unclear of where they were going to be matching into existing grade and whatnot. Um, but here it's like, it, it's just, it's actually the, <laughs> when it comes to disturbing sea flows, it's like the simplest way you could say like, okay, there's this zone here, um, for cutting a hole and putting a building in it. Um, and the rest is staying the same. Um, and, um, so yeah, I, I do think this is before and after, but essentially the image and the map created for the before and after is going to be identical to what is already in the record. Um, and so in the nation of like, wherever possible to avoid the, applicant from paying an engineer to just do another map but you know mm -hmm. I, I i do feel enough uniqueness with this application to um set it apart from the others and not, and not require that at this juncture okay thanks rob that's very thoughtful um and make makes a lot of sense and what do others think michael you can weigh in if you'd like i don't I agree with Rob. I don't think we need any additional post construction information from the would it, would it Would it be an option to take pictures for the record? I mean, if it, it would probably make more sense, you could actually see a little bit better in terms of what the slope actually looks like and what mm -hmm. it will look like at the end. So it's like, because I can take a perspective and it might give a little bit better visual of actually what, what it is. It, if that is simple, if that is simple to do, and then combined with the discussion that we've just had, which is also now part of the record, um, that could could suffice. Um, since you've expressed an openness to either taking pictures or or having another map drawn, I think um, perhaps in our deliberations we can we can determine whether the complexity of the application warrants one or the other. Okay. Um, would that be all right with board members? Yes. Okay, not to create suspense or anything, but we have some good options and I appreciate that. All right, so we've talked about the footing drains, we've talked about the sediment barrier locations and the steep slope design standards. Um, is there anything else in those areas that board members want to think more about or ask about? Do you have the information you need to make decisions? Okay. Good, so the next uh, section we'll look at is erosion control. This is where the silt barrier came in and we've talked about that a few times. Um, and regarding stormwater management, we've talked about that too, the footing drain. Um, so um, in order, 
you know, we've, we've just seen that as part of the record in this hearing, it would be um, necessary to submit or that revised picture showing how the footing drain goes, goes around and where it points to yep. um, probably as a condition of, of the permit should, should we approve it. Yep. Okay. Um, the standards having to do with access and circulation, parking and loading and signs don't apply to this project. So we'll move past them. Um, those are the standards we needed to review. Um, board members, is there anything else you want to ask about or comment on? Okay, so as I mentioned at the um, start of the meeting, we do take our deliberations into a deliberative session during this Zoom uh, environment, Zoom time, in order to issue more effective decisions. Then we issue a written decision at the end. So at this point, um, I would entertain a motion from a DRB member to close the public hearing on this application and go into deliberative session after the close of the public meeting. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Motion by Jean. Second. Second by Rob. Thank you. I'll call the roll. Jean? Yes. Michael? Yes. Abby? Yes. Rob? Yes. I vote yes as well. The motion carries and we will deliberate on this at the close of the public meeting. Um, Justin, thank you very much for your time and the information. Thank you we'll all. We'll be in touch as soon as possible. Sounds good. Take care, guys. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. That concludes our first item of business. a brief overview of where we're heading and that should give folks a chance to come on into the meeting who may may or may not uh, be clear close to their computers um, but as before we will um, swear in witnesses anyone who wishes to provide testimony on this um, and that will include the, um, the appellant um, that will include the applicant and anyone else who thinks they might like to make some comments um, at that point i'll ask mike miller who will be staffing this um, application to give an overview. And then the likely, likely order is going to be as follows. Um, as in contrast to a permit application, in this case, the case the, the case of the question being brought is, is by the appellants. So they will present their case. That will be presented by Charles Phillips and Elizabeth Strobel. And then the board will have a chance to ask questions. After that, the property owner, Steve Ribellini, uh, will present his case and the board can ask questions. And then if there's anyone else here who's interested in being heard on this, they can make comments. We ask that they stay relatively brief, two to three minutes, and then the board can ask questions. Um, at that point, depending on what's come up and what has or hasn't been resolved by that time, um, I'll invite responses uh, from the appellant, the property owner, and additional questions from the board as needed. So that's where we're headed. At this point, I would like to swear in anyone who wants to speak on this application. So um, anyone who is going to make a public comment, if they could please raise their right hand. Thank you. Um, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? Yes, yeah, I do. I do. Thank you very much. So I've just um, sworn in Steve Rivellini, Charles Phillips, and Betsy Strobel, and Richard Shire. That's H-E-I-R. Sheer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very good. Um, so I will turn to Mike Miller to give an overview of this um, of this appeal. Mike. Good evening, everybody. So um, I just wanted to kind of give a quick update for uh, members of the board as well as you know the public. Um, so appeals of the zoning administrative decision are pretty rare. We don't get a lot of them in, ten, um, in, in the city. Um, we usually resolve most of these um, before they ever get to you. Um, but when we do have appeals that go to the board, um, it's not required under law, but we like to, as a policy, as a part of good governance, go and hand the appeal off to somebody else, which is me as the planning director in this case. Uh, and that's just to make sure that um, there's no sense that anyone, you know, to, to have the zoning administrator 
right um, a dis determination or a decision and have that get appealed and then the staff reports written by the zoning administrator somebody may not feel like they're getting a full um, picture so we always hand it off just because it, it makes good governance and so that's why I'm here to um, handle the staff review side of the zoning uh, appeal in this case um, so as Kate mentioned um, in these cases, the appellant has the burden of proof, so it's kind of a little bit different than what you're used to looking at. Um, and so um, we'll also only be looking at a limited number of things because we're not looking at an entire application. We're looking at the merits of the appeal that was uh, presented. So there is an application pending associated with this as well, and it's been um, left on hold waiting for the outcome of this decision. So there, there will be opportunities to kind of address the application, or if you need to condition something, you do have that ability because there is an associated application, but your decisions and your motions that you'll be making and either approving or denying is to approve or deny an appeal. Um, so unless somebody has some questions about some of the, the, the format or details, I'll just go through a quick, um, real quick summary so this was oh uh, excuse, excuse me mike if, if i could just restate something at the risk of being really redundant or obvious just it's a little new um so we're not appealing a perm we're, this is not an appeal of a permit because no permit has been issued this is an appeal of a decision that the zoning administrator made regarding a, a zoning violation and so the, the decision that was written up about that zoning violation had some facts in it and some findings and the nature or the the veracity of those facts and findings are being questioned through the appeal. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Please, please go ahead. Thanks. All right. So this did start a little bit back last August. Um, there were some complaints about um, the, the light. Uh, so the property in question is 197 Main Street. Um, that's uh, owned by Blueberry Associates. And the neighboring property is 4 Harrison Ave and the residents at that property are the ones who um, who had asked and had um, had some complaints about the lights that had been installed. Um, there was some investigation, some studying that that went on and eventually Meredith made a determination on that. And that is, as Kate mentioned, is what is being um, appealed. Now, the owner of the property at 197 has been working to try to remedy the issue. And um, so there is an application. The construction was done, the lights were installed, but now there's an application pending to kind of address the, the installation of those lights. So uh, that's a little bit of the, the paperwork background that we're looking at. But the appeal was of the determination, um, which was in your packet. And we're really gonna be looking at uh, four, four items. One of them is um, just to make an affirmation about the validity of the appeal. Um, which there is a, a staff finding in there, staff recommendation on that. Uh, and then three facts within the exterior lighting that should be addressed. Uh, one of which is about the shielding, one of which is about the total lumens, and one of them is about the allowed lamp types. So there are basically gonna be three decision points I think that would need to be made in this appeal. Um, so Meredith will still be here to answer um, some questions if you have questions about the determination, but um, the staff report, those questions, I will handle those. Thank you, Mike. At this point, I'm going to pause and see if DRB members have any questions about anything they've heard so far. Okay, thanks. So Mike, you're, you're all done with your overview. Thanks. So I'm um, going to turn next to to the um, oh Jean. Yes, go ahead. So the modification was just uh, shields, like wooden shields, that were added to to lessen so, the lumens or or increase the lumens. So the 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 the. Some getting a little bit more specific with the history. So there was there was an existing outdoor, um, I believe it's an outdoor stairwell that has lights in in the stairwell, uh, and so those lights were replaced. 
the light fixtures themselves, uh, they were formerly, um, I believe they were uh, more box um, ones and they were replaced with LEDs. The new lamps um, were different, obviously created a, a difference for the neighbors who then questioned um, and found that this project should have had permits in advance, um, but the lights were replaced without the permits. So now we were kind of working backwards um, to, to fix that problem. So one question was with the shielding and we'll get to some of the, the decision points on there, but one was there was too much light going on to the neighbor's windows. So the first thing they tried to do was to modify the lights by putting some shielding around them to add extra shielding. Um, and that did not solve the problem. Um, okay. And so the question, the, the application continued, but there was still a question of whether it, you know, whether it did or didn't meet the shielding requirements, whether it did or didn't meet the lumen requirements. Um, and that's what was appealed. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Mike. And we will get into those details more later as well, but that, that's a good roadmap for where we are going. All right, so I'm going to turn to the appellants. So um, Charles and Betsy, uh, this is your opportunity to talk a little bit about um, why you're here tonight, what you'd like the board to know about, about your appeal. And after that, the board will have a chance to ask you some questions. So please go ahead. Okay, well, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, board members, for your service. And particularly, we'd like to thank Meredith, who has uh, shepherded us through this process and has been a great help. And I should note that uh, we've been neighbors of Steve for a number of years, and we've had issues like trees that needed to be removed and fences and all, and we've always been able mutually to come up with a satisfactory uh, solution. So we're optimistic that, that we're headed in that direction. Um, as was Michael outlined, uh, there were some new lights put on the back of the apartment house on Main Street. And uh, from our vantage point, drastically include and in, uh, increase the amount of light uh, that was coming into our backyard and particularly into the backside of our house and, and it's a fairly straightforward issue uh, Steve has already tried to remedy it and somehow in the process uh, I, I think some of the regulations came to play uh, not because we knew what the regulations were but uh, that the type of light that should have been installed was not installed so I think that's basically where we're at Okay. Yeah. Okay, you're both welcome to speak at any point if, if you if you like. But okay, thank you. Um, all right. So, do board members have any any questions so far? Okay. Uh, we might get into this, Kate, if we yeah. the details. But I'm wondering about just the the lumens requirement. We can we can talk is. about that. Um, the okay. lumens require, yeah, yeah we, we can, we can start kind of bringing some of the, the facts of the case, case to the surface. So, um, I might, I might turn to, to staff for this, but I believe it's a max because it's 80, it's because of the zone where it's located, because of the purposes of the light, the, the reasons that lighting is used, there are eight units, which allows, um, 10,000 lumens, lumens per dwelling unit for a total of 80,000. And the materials submitted by the property owner say that the actual output is 51,550 51, lumens. Okay. Okay. Correct. Okay. Thanks. That's a nice segue. So um, next, we'll we'll turn we'll turn to the property owner. We'll turn to Steve Ribellini if you'd like to tell us. Um, uh, present to us um, what what has been happening for, for you in this in this case and what you'd like us to know. Hey, well, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I just want to make it clear that uh, we didn't add any light fixtures. We just replaced existing ones. And um, these existing ones have a, a flat uh, lens on them. Um, I think one of the reasons that um, they uh, look so much brighter as one, they're LEDs. And a question has come up at some point, 
um, could the bulbs be changed to a warm white bulb? But um, they can't, they're not bulbs in there. They're like a, an LED strip. So there's nothing to change. If you take the cover off, there's no bulb to unscrew or, uh, and change. Um, <clears throat> then we did uh, try to put a wooden uh, shield about uh, out of a one by four, uh, maybe say the lights are around eight inches square. And I think the uh, shield's about uh, 12 inches square. Um, hoping that would uh, direct more light straight down. Because this is a um, three stories um, and really from the backside of Loomis Street, um, it's really four stories if you count the basement. So with the stairs go up, so to uh, uh, Charlie and Betsy's house, if you look out a second floor window, you know, it's not the first floor that's bothering so much as the upper floors, I believe. Right. Yeah. From what I understand it, yeah. they're actually seeing underneath the light, I would say. Sure. And uh, yeah, this was nothing uh, we did on purpose. You know, the light had burnt out over a period of time. You know, when you get uh, that many fixtures and a bulb would burn out and, and a ballast would burn out or something. And so at some point, and we'd had to, um, some issues over there with lighting. And so we just thought, well, to do the right thing, we'll just have the electrician come put these new lights in. So we said, to him, replace these lights for us. And they did. And that's when we started down this road. Um, so, you know, we were hoping this uh, shrouding would have helped some, but, and I think Betsy had said in an email that it had helped some, but mm -hmm. not as much as they would like. Mm -hmm. And it's primarily the upper floors, you're right, because those are the floors that shine, you know, on us. We've yeah. got the fence that's providing a little bit of relief from the lower floor light. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm hearing, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. even though I think the, um, they're a higher or brighter light than what was there, mm -hmm. um, we're within the movement of them. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that's right, we were trying to, do something to maybe feel them. Mm -hmm. And we want a light that's bright enough for the tenants going up and down three flights of stairs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, board members, some questions? Gene, go ahead. So on those, what you specified on the box fixtures that you added, can you implement or put an additional shield, plastic, clear, but shielded, tinted uh, st structure on the bottom of the box? Perhaps. I mean, there might be some other things that could be done, yeah. um, you know, that would help. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Jane. Um, other board members? Trying to, you know, process is important here. I'm trying to sort of like understand how we got here, where we're at. So my understanding is, is that um, there was a upgrades to lights, lighting that happened, um, which, uh, you know, the determination of the zoning administrator was is that should have been done through an administrative site plan uh, amendment, um, but it was, it, it was not. Um, and uh, that's how we got here. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Um, so there's there's an issue not just with the lumens, although it sounds like that's um, maybe not. So if the, if the limit is, as you said, Kate, 80,000, 80, we're at like 51. There's also the issue of the temperature of the light. And it sounds like that may be more of the issue that the, that the Kelvin, 
which determines how warm or cool a light is. In this case, is it's more on the cool side. Am I understanding that right? I guess this is a question for, for uh, Charles and Betsy. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, we didn't even know light temperature was an issue, was something that could be addressed. And from our understanding, the, the, the city requirements are that lights on a building be of the warm white rather than the cool white. Is that true? Yes, that is the requirement. Okay. So that is a requirement. Did you say that? Is that Mike? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. It's a bit it of an irony. Specify here, the Kelvin exactly. It just says of the of a warm. And there is a, a significant difference, in, in, especially with the LEDs on the cool white. Um, hence, we're here. <laughs> um, I recall. 10 years ago, I was working on street light swap outs and we were going from like that kind of cool, moody, pinkish um, sodium light to the LEDs. And there were a lot of conversations in communities about how alarming, how alarming that is. And that's an extreme case, of course, but um, just kind of following on what, what Jean said about just the quality of the light with these different bulbs can um, really catch your attention, uh, different technology. Um, other questions from board members? Okay, so this this is a good discussion and we're, we're going to keep kind of- I do oh, have a question. Yeah. Is there is there a possibility of replacing the, the light strip, Steve, that you described to be of a warmer variety? I, I don't know that. That question only came up today. I know okay. I heard it today, so I didn't have time to investigate whether that could be done or not, but it may be possible. I okay. did look into to see if they could be put on a dimmer, but that type of, you know, so I thought we could just, because they're all turned on and off with a photo cell. I was hoping we could put a dimmer in and just dim them so that when the photo cell came on, they came on to a not quite as bright perhaps, but you can't do that with that type of light. Yeah, they, I know I know a lot about LED technology and there are different, um, I mean, you can do so much in terms of changing the temperature of LEDs remotely. So that might be just something to talk to your electrician about, like what are the other options available? Or the, perhaps the company that built the light. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, would, would know more. And I'd be willing to do that. Okay. Great. Um, Thanks. So um, I do want to make sure there's an opportunity for other folks who um, have an interest in commenting to have the chance to do so. Um, and I know that I swore in Richard. So um, Richard, if you'd like to speak, this this is um, this is an opportunity. And and anyone else who is here to be heard on this. Um, let's check in again with Rich, Richard Shear, if you want to unmute and, and join us. Okay, here we go. Uh, okay. Richard Shear from yeah. 39 Loomis. I am another neighbor uh, who abuts that property and can look up there. To be perfectly honest, um, our son was living in the room at the time, and no one noticed it in, in that particular room for a reason, and that's that there are curtains that are used in those rooms because the sun is coming out at 5.30 in the morning. So normally during the day, when those lights aren't on, the room is open and uncurtained, and then it's curtained at night. And again, we've been next to that building for over 20 years. It's not as if those lights weren't there in another version before, because they were. And they were sufficient to have us curtaining that. It's, we just don't see that issue from our house at all. And we have the same view as they have, but about 20 feet to the west. So whether this thing is how bright it is, how warm it is, that really just doesn't play in, in bedrooms that are curtained. 
properly curtained as almost everyone has bedroom curtains. And I would say that in a three-story building, you want curtains in there because you want your privacy. So it just seems like this complaint just doesn't, if, if it had fallen a, a skew of the lumens, if, if Steve was at 85,000 instead of 80,000 lumens, then I could understand this complaint, but we just don't see it. And we are approximate neighbors just as they are. Okay. Well, thank you as we're discussing how to, what the problem is and how to solve it. Um, I appreciate the other data point um, from the neighborhood. Um, okay, everybody's muted and unmuted who wants to be. Um, Okay, are there any um, any board questions for Richard based on Richard's comments? Okay, so um, I had said that at this point there could be a little bit of, of back and forth and, and rebuttal, if you will. Rebuttal, it's, it's kind of an informal process, but or a formal informal, an informal formal process. Um, I, I think what I would like to do is go instead is go through the staff report and use that as our framework for further discussion. We've touched on a lot of the key points, um, but at, during that or after that, um, there will be an opportunity um, for, for um, both the appellant and the applicant to, to speak again. Um, so if that's agreeable to all, I will I'll go that way. Okay. All right. So we're going to look at the... Um, at the at the staff report, um, I hope folks have it. Um, as Mike said at the outset, there are a few determinations that that we need to make, and and the first is that we need to, as a board, affirm the validity of the appeal. Um, the findings uh, we we must determine that it's an appeal of an administrative act or decision, and it is. It's a notice of it's a um, determination of noncompliance um, that that is being. A determination of violation that's being appealed. It must be made by an interested person and the neighbors are interested persons. Um, it needs to be done on time within 15 days of the issuance of the decision and that was done on time and the notice of appeal was proper um, including uh, noticing and publication and information shared with all and that was properly done. So um, the appeal is, is valid. Um, do board members have any questions about that? Okay. Um, and just as kind of a background for, for the permit that is in the background of this, that is being contemplated, it is a minor site plan review, so it doesn't require a lighting plan by a designer or an engineer. So that's why we're talking about the things in the way that we are with the materials that we have. Um, all right, so we, we've talked about the, the lumens and the allow, allowability. It has to do with this being class two lighting which is about visibility, safety, and security. And that's the primary concern. And then we've got different zones in town for different types of lighting. And this is lighting zone one, which is the Res 3000 district. Um, so let's, let's go a little bit deeper. We started talking about the shielding. So um, all out, the standard that we need to meet here is all outdoor lighting fixtures shall be shielded in accordance with figure 3-21 of the zoning, all class three lights in zone one, shall be fully shielded regardless of initial lumen output. So we've received testimony that um, some one by fours were used to put, you know, the, the light fixture itself was about eight by eight. The one by fours were about um, 12 by 12, putting a 12 by 12 square. And um, we've heard from the appellants that that is, is not sufficient, particularly for the upper floors. Um, I think something I'm interested in knowing Given the elevation difference between the home on on Harrison and the and the one on corner Loomis and Maine, um, I, I'm wondering there there are other places besides Montpelier with hills and homes and apartments, and I wonder if anyone knows what some of the best practices are, whether for types of light fixtures or shieldings when it comes to um, places that are configured that way. Are there special are there special light fixtures for just this purpose on the hillsides of Italy? You know, I mean, I, I'm just kind of wondering um, if anyone's given any thoughts to that. Yeah. 
Well, from my experience, because I've, I've built boxes for either diffusing light to go upward, and then so it's covered downward, or vice versa. So there, there are diffusing tactics and, and shielding available if it's so it's something that you would have to discuss with, with a contractor or, or electrician re regarding you know diffusing the lamps if, especially if you already have you've already tried and installed some some of those boxes it, it'd be probably simple enough to to get a, a tinted you know but yet yeah, transparent diffusing shielding on the bottom of it Okay. It, it's hard that, to it, it's it's really hard to uh, give a perspective without looking at, at what they've actually built on the building to to determine okay. the exact specific fixture that that could be implemented. Uh -huh. And I I didn't see in our packet. This is either a mic or a, probably a mic question. Um, were there images included with the? retrofitted shielding of those lights. I didn't see that in our packet and I'm wondering if I missed it. No, I don't think they were in your packet. We got, we have a picture of the lamps, but not of the, uh -huh. the, the one bias that were boxed around it. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, I'll, I'll point out in, in the staff report, you know, we, we looked at this from an objective standpoint. Um, going back and we put in the staff report the definition of the fully shield, shielded light and it really comes down to whether or not it allows light to go above the horizon. Um, so the the shielding itself probably for somebody who is downhill probably it's, it's it may not fully do it there there are other requirements in our zoning if there was a different in a different situation there's um, some other requirements that could apply if this was a different project, a commercial project, uh, rather than a residential project um, that could have required, you know, lamps not be, you know, they have to be set back farther from the property lines. Um, but uh, those types of requirements didn't apply in this, in this specific case. Um, but okay. the case of the shielding, um, based on the definition, and, and I think Meredith and I would have a question um, for you because Meredith felt, and I would agree with her, that these lights probably met the shielding requirements without having those, those boxes that Steve had put in to try to mitigate the problem. Um, and if we know that, then we've got the, but Meredith has the ability to make some determinations later on if somebody comes in and asks about them. I think the issue is not with the, the the lights not being lamps not being shielded or the fact that Steve didn't put in proper shielding around them. They met the technical definition of a shielded light. It just wasn't, there would be very little they could do. I mean, there'd have to be, you'd have to screen, screen in the porch, which the lights are in, in order to block the lights from actually getting to the, to the abutter property based on how high mm -hmm. the light is and where their property is. Okay. Thanks, Mike. So this, the shielding requirement of the zoning is, is, is your and Meredith determination that it, it meets the technical specs of that. And so I think I think what we're hearing is that because of the difference, because of the elevation difference, if you will, um, we, we could shield a lot and it may still not solve the problem. Um, okay. Um, questions from DRB members about shielding. Okay, and I'll kind of go in order. I'll give um, Charles and Betsy a chance to comment on that if they wish, and then and then Steve about shielding before we move on. So go ahead if you'd like, Charles and Betsy. If, there, if there's anything you want to add, I think that Steve went beyond to put those boxes around. And you're right; it's the elevation, as much as anything, that you know is is making it bright on our property. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I would add, I'm assuming that the board uh, would take into account the tone of Steve Steve's letter. I don't mean Steve, I mean Richard's letter. 
And there, there's some factual uh, things that, that he said that are not accurate. Uh, I particularly took offense by the statement he felt that we had fictionalized the facts. Uh, that's tantamount to calling us liars. I don't think it's appropriate, and I don't think it furthers the discussion, and that's all I'm going to say on that account. Okay. Thank you for, thank you for responding to that. We've noted it. Thank you. Um, speaking of a little more on the shielding, Steve, is there anything you wanted to add on that topic before we move on? No, uh, just one thing, and that was, I said, these boards are uh, one by four, so technically they're three and a half inches wide. Um, and it, I believe the light itself only steps down an inch from the mm -hmm. ceiling. So, you know, there's about two and a half inches of shielding. I thought about putting like a one by six on there or even a one by eight. But if I did that, then the box itself um, you know, where uh, it could impede um, moving furniture in and out or you know, stuff like that. It, it, you know, because those porches, I didn't measure it, but I'd say from floor to ceiling, it's maybe just a little over seven feet. So, you so know, yeah. just about seven feet. So, you yeah. know, rather you come down with, with something, the right. bigger problem there'll be. Different set of problems, right? Right. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to move on to the next of the standards that, that we're looking through here in the staff report, which has to do with output. We talked about lumens, that's the measure of output and what's allowed is 80,000, 80, what's there is 51,550. So about just under less than two thirds of what is required. Um, and I, I as, as one board member, I, I'm, I would be challenged to assess what additional lumen reduction would be would end up being enough. You know, where would that um, sweet spot be of of safety, as this lighting is meant to provide, and in a fence <laughs> from from nearby properties. I, I don't know that I can pick, it, given that it's already at two thirds of what's allowed. I don't know how much lower one could go to make it work. So I'm going to invite board member comments or questions on this issue, and then we'll do the same thing, Charles and Betsy, and then Steve. Um, I, I really think it's a question of the temperature, the Kelvin, and not the lumens. Okay. My That's my guess. I think that, that you can find replacement bulbs that have a lower Kelvin, like in the 2700 range. I think that would help. Uh -huh. okay. Because these are strips, already installed strips and not bulbs. So I don't think that the strips, you have to find out if those strips have, because I've installed LED strips that have over a dozen options of, of warm temperature and lighting and and so like you could fade them, you could color them. So find out if those strips have any options to like you mentioned earlier. Okay. Well it's these are really related in terms of quality okay, of the Michael. light. Oh yeah, go ahead, Michael. So I I just want to say it sounds like we're doing a lot of sort of guessing and opining. And I'll just say to the to the property owner. This is exactly what efficiency Vermont is for. Not only can they provide technical guidance, but they can even provide uh, likely rebates for any retrofitting going on. And we all, we all pay into the efficiency Vermont fee to fund that, that type of guidance. So to the extent that efficiency Vermont has not been brought to the site, I would encourage the property owner to do that and, and utilize their guidance. Thanks, Michael. That is a resource that's available, and we, um, yeah, we can we can know some basics about the science of brightness and the Kelvins. And I'm glad I know what K stands for now. Um, uh, we know what warm is compared to what's there. Um, but for that it, more in-depth lighting design and efficiency and popular rebates, yes, indeed. Um, and I'm happy at this point to sort of combine our conversation about lumens, which is the total output standard, 
and lamp types, which is the Kelvins and, and, and temperature conversation um, in, in our comments next. So um, Rob, did you uh, have a question? No. Okay. Good. So we're, we're kind of focusing in on what, what is under one's control, <laughs> possibly at, at, at this stage. Um, and it seems like a possible next step uh, that would, well, I'm sorry, we're supposed to be finding, making findings, not designing a project for you. Um, I want to give you that, uh, that, is, that is your prerogative. Um, but what we've determined is that the, um, the, lumen, the standard regarding lumens is met. Based on the conversation and the observations by our staff about the brightness of the light, we, we, are, we are arriving at the conclusion that the, the standard regarding lamp type is not met with what's been installed because it's too cool. The temperature is too cool. And I expect, I assume that a likely remedy would be to get a warmer temperature bulb as we've been discussing. Um, so according to the staff, staff report, um, we, we are finding that the appellant's claims for relief based on the lamp type are valid, whereas the shielding is met, the lumens are met. They, they strictly speaking, meet the regulations. But in that third, um, for that, in that third category, uh, the, the lamps do not comply with the zoning um, is, is kind of where we're landing. Um, board members, any questions about what I just said? Okay, so so I'll um, turn to Charles and Betsy, and then and then Steve uh, for any any comments or reflections or additions at this point. Uh, I I think the suggestion that Michael made about uh, con contacting Energy Vermont is worthwhile pursuing. I think uh, there are a number of questions in terms of how effective remediation would be in various forms and and. I, as I said at the beginning, Steve and Betsy and I have been able to work together, uh, and uh, I suspect we would be able to continue to do that. So uh, I, I don't know what we need at this particular point, other than uh, I feel confident that uh, maybe the three of us can, can work out a satisfactory solution without uh, having anything mandated at this particular point. I don't know how Steve feels. I don't even know how Betsy feels. So I may be in trouble when, when the evening's over. You, you can go on mute for a minute if you need know. <laughs> <laughs> leave the room. I, 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 would, I would think that um, changing the temperature of the, of the light and keeping you know, the number of lumens the way it is would be satisfactory. And if it's not, then it's on us. Okay. And, and um, I, I appreciate that we're having this conversation. I want to, um, for anyone watching or wondering, just note that it, we are doing this within the framing of the zoning requirements. So we are not in the process of saying, we've got this really creative idea that's not required by the zoning, go figure yeah. it out. So, um, so this is within within the bounds. So th that idea about warming up the light, um, Steve, would you would you care to respond? Um, yes, I would uh, respond. So I, like I said, I think that may be possible by one, um, as I said, talk to Efficiency Vermont, and also talk to the uh, manufacturer of the lights because uh -huh. um, maybe they do make a strip that. Uh, could be retrofitted to those. Um, like I say, and I think it's <clears throat> been mentioned a few times that to put in warmer temperature bulbs, but just yeah. for the record, they're not bulbs. You know, it's, yeah. we always call them light bulbs, but they're really Thank not. You. Bulbs is shorthand for right. Right. Yeah. bright device. Yeah. No, and, 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 and both Charlie and Betsy have been good neighbors and we have had uh, other conversations, like they said, with a tree and with a fence one time, and maybe a few other things, maybe even a tenant or two. <laughs> but, <laughs> I don't think we've gone there. <laughs> Outside of our jurisdiction. <laughs> but, uh, um, so, yeah, if we could, uh, I mean, I don't know what decision has to be made tonight, if any, if we could, like, extend for 30 days or mm -hmm. you know, something like that. I'm fine. Um, you know what? 
Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you all. Um, I'm, I'm going to look to Mike on procedure, but it, it's, I believe it's the DRB's job tonight to um, determine the, whether the appeal the parts of the appeal that that have merit based based on our evaluation and I, I think that we've, we've discussed that the shielding requirements are met the lumen requirements are met but the temperature requirements of the zoning are not and so on that basis the the appeal is um have a valid claim yeah. the appellants have a, a valid claim and then separate from this process will be the administrative permit um undertaken with uh, applied for um, to merit to the zoning administrator, right. and it's it's in that process that you'll dot your I's and cross your T's to make sure that whatever's in there, whatever you're applying for the permit for, meets the requirements of the permit, particularly the temperature of the light, not bulb. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, right. For clarity, what is the temperature that I'm going to ask them for? According yeah. to the regulations, it's it's just defined as warm light. Um, Meredith and I did take a look through the regulations. We did not find a definition, but if you were to look under, uh, you know, we, we just Googled what it would be. Um, and, and in the cut sheets that you had provided of your lamps you had installed, it had neutral white uh, 4,000 or cool white 5,000. Now we don't know which one got installed, but we know it was either a 4,000 K neutral or a 5000 K cool. But typically, um, what we found on Google was 2800 or 28,000 to 3000 was about a range that you'd see warm light. Um, okay. As Abby was saying 27, you, you can kind of in that range less than 3000. Okay, well, that's helpful. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So if, um, I could, if I could uh, just yeah. make one final comment um, just to to the neighbors and to Steve, um, as we work our way through, um, and maybe this is also helpful for the public and for the DRB, my role as planning director, uh, I work with the planning commission to write the zoning that the DRB and the zoning administrator gets to implement. And what we try to do as much as possible is to make good sets of rules. Um, so therefore, if we find that let's say Steve uh, gets warm lights and installs them and we still have problems, that's helpful for me to know. Um, he, he's not in violation of the zoning and therefore there's probably not much legally you could do from that standpoint, but it's very helpful from my perspective and from the planning, co planning commission's perspectives to make sure that our rules are doing what we want them to do. So if, if it works, if the warm lights fix the problem, then we know our rules have been are doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is, you know, if you put in warm lights and you meet this lumen and you have this amount of shielding, then it should be good. Um, and if they don't, then it's also helpful for us to know because we'll have to go and take a look at the rules to make sure there isn't something that we overlooked or something else that we should be checking for. Um, and it may just be this is a unique case. Um, normally you can't have a light above 25 feet off the ground. So usually that's not a problem for an abutter. Um, but in your case, these are in a stairwell that's much higher than that, but that's legal because it's part of a building. Yeah. So it may just be a unique case that the zoning will never be able to account for. But if whichever way this works, um, I would certainly be interested in finding out how this turns out just so that way I've got the information I can take back to the planning commission and make sure our rules are, are doing what we want them to do to, to make sure that we're being good neighbors and creating good situations. So. Um, however, this turns out, I'd be I'd appreciate hearing back from everybody. Okay, thanks. And Mike, perhaps there even becomes a definition in the definition section of what what is warm, what the range yes. is that is warm. And that's probably implied in what you're saying. So that's already already in our notes on the list. Already there. All right. Um, any last questions from DRB members before we move on? I think I think we've gotten through this. All right. Um, in keeping with my statement at the beginning of the meeting, we will be um, deciding upon this in a, deliber a closed deliberative session and then issuing a written decision. Um, and we're doing that for all applications in the Zoom environment. Uh, so with that in mind, I would take a motion from a DRME member to close the public hearing and go into deliberative session after the close of the public meeting. 
Um, Motion by Jean. Second. Second by Rob. Thank you. I'll call the roll. Jean? Yes. Michael? Yes. Abby? Yes. Rob? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Thank you. We will deliberate on this at the close of the public meeting. Um, thank you to everybody who participated, including folks who may have signed off. Um, this is important um, for people to, to have their voice and to, and to take the time and, and thank you all for doing it. Thank, thank you. you very much, everyone. Good night. Good night. All right. That brings us to the third and final item on our agenda, which is 27 Liberty Street. We'll give folks a chance to come on or off the, the call. Welcome. Welcome to those who are joining. Uh, very good. So shifting gears a little bit. Thanks. Thanks for waiting and for being part of this hearing. Those who have been who have been tuning in and waiting. Um, so uh, we are looking at 27 Liberty Street for the dem the demolition of part of a historic structure. Um, the way that we're going to proceed with this is we're going to swear in the witnesses. That's anyone who wants to speak about this application. Uh, and then Meredith will give us an overview of the project and we'll hear, hear from the applicants. And then we'll walk through the staff report um, with, a, with a focus on those items where there are bigger question marks and, and kind of looking through those, not spending a lot of time on the areas where that, that don't apply. Okay, so um, for anyone who would like to be heard on this, could you please raise your right hand? Okay. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? Yes. We've got some yeses. Very good. So we, we've just sworn in Rick Cannon, Gary Rose, and I'm sorry, I what what's what's your name? Lori. Lori Rose. Rose. Also Rose? Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, Meredith, could you please give us an overview? Yes. Um, so, as you said, in this situation, we have um, demolition of part of a historic structure. The building as a whole is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, and in that description, which was in the packet, um, they, they do include this sunroom slash sleeping porch in that description. Um, but we've got a situation here where that sunroom was added at a later date. We aren't sure quite when, but it was added at a later date. It's in extreme disrepair. Um, and so the applicants want to take that sunroom off and combination of reconstruct and rehab the original porch structure below it. So this is coming to the DRB um, because it is demolition of part of a historic structure. Um, the main issue here really is going through those demolition criteria. A reminder that the, the criteria about evaluating um, demolition as part of a historic structure, specifically the um, undue financial hardship, which seems to be where the DRB goes a lot in these dis decisions, they don't have to meet all of those criteria. It's a situation where the board just has to consider the following factors as relevant. Um, so a lot of those criteria when you're dealing with a single family home situation really aren't going to be relevant, especially if you're not talking about demolition of the entire structure. Here we're talking about demolition of a really teeny tiny part of it that really can't be used for much of anything. Um, so look at those with a critical eye when you're going through it. And that's what I tried to do in the staff report. Okay. Thanks, Meredith. And, and the reason that we that we're doing zoning with a list of things for consideration, which doesn't sound much like a checklist of standards, um, is that you know you are before a, a board that is a little bit more discretionary um, and taking into account the whole of the situation, using those using those um, considerations as a guide. If this was something that could be evaluated with a checklist, it wouldn't be bef before um, five five people thinking. It would be be before one person thinking. Not that our one person isn't highly capable. Um, That's okay. so. I'm quite happy to put things like this to you guys. That's why they're you're here. <laughs> okay, great. So um, I'll turn it over next to the applicants, to Gary and Lori, if you'd like to tell us a little bit about um, 
what you're doing and why, why I'd like to demolish the um, structure and some of the, some of the circumstances around it. Well, it's a historic building uh, built in the 1890s, a uh, Victorian and, and uh, the sleeping porch was at it sometime later and uh, it has fallen into disrepair. And uh, we have the original plans of, of the house and uh, we would like to return mm -hmm. it to the original plan. Very good, thank you. So um, we're gonna go into the staff report before I do, are there any kind of, um, any basic questions from DRB members? Okay. Um, yeah. When was that, the, so that structure, when was that added? How many years later, do you think? Yeah, we don't know. I would guess 70s or 80s maybe, I don't know. Okay, that recently, okay. Good. Um, and at, at this point, um, I, I, I um, want to acknowledge Rick, Rick Cannon. We swore you in as well. I, I think what I'd like to do is just get a, a couple words quickly on the general nature of your of your interest, what you might like to speak to, and I can um, then determine whether I should have you speak now or during the relevant part of the of the staff review. If you'd be willing to to share just kind of the nature of what your comments would be. Sure. Um, yeah, I suspect the uh, sleeping porch. Uh, was added above the original um, open porch below, which is very attractive, uh, Victorian um, architect, uh, 60s or 70s, um, and I believe it was um, added by, I um, hope I'm not hurting anyone's feelings, by a carpenter who really didn't know what they were doing. Um, so, uh, it's in a bad um, condition at this point. And um, the, you know, the support uh, over the header area of the porch below um, wasn't even, wasn't the support of the, uh, the, the sleeping porch above wasn't set upon the header area it was it was set upon the rafter tails out by the fascia board so it's yeah it was just um sort of a bad idea maybe maybe an okay idea but just not a very um uh, uh, a good way to build the thing and so it has been moving over the years and i can answer any questions you have after that thank you very thank much you. All right, so um, great. Um, we're going to move into the <clears throat> into the criteria and staff report then, unless anyone has anything to add. All right. Um, so we have the general standards that we just want to ensure are being met. The first of those is the use standards. Um, this is the Res Three District. There's no change of use. This is a single family dwelling, which is allowed. So requirements are met. Similarly, having to do with dimensional standards, that sort of structures, um, pretty much nothing is changing in terms of the setbacks from the property line or the coverage on the, on the ground. Um, and there aren't any units being added or anything like that. So it is, it meets those criteria. So that brings us right along to um, section 3004, which is, which is demolition. Um, so we're going to look at those considerations. Um, and again, it's here because it's, it's listed as a contributing structure to the historic sites and structure survey and the National Register for Historic Resources. Um, so what we are, we are looking at, um, the board needs to make a finding that either the rehabilitation of the structure or a portion thereof would, would cause undue financial hardship to the owner or that the demolition is part of a grander plan um, with substantial benefit to the community. So that's why we're looking at the first one, fin the financial hardship one. And we do look at this very, very frequently um, when it comes to demolition. Um, so this is a non-income producing property. That's one thing to know about it. Um, so the ultimate finding for the financial hardship test is that we need to determine that the building or site or object and the porch is the object in this situation, has no beneficial use as a residential dwelling or for an institutional use in its present state 
or if rehabilitated, or if rehabilitated, and denial of the application would deprive the owner of all reasonable use of the property. Um, and we consider these factors. Um, the knowledge of property's historical significance at the time of acquisition or of its status subsequent, and the structural soundness of the building. So um, I, I think this is where we're, we're just supposed to ask you, um, Gary and Lori, that um, were you aware that it was a historic structure when, when you purchased it? Uh, not the uh, legal definition, but certainly uh, <laughs> we knew the age of the house and were uh, very good about maintaining the character of the, okay. the property. Thank you. Um, uh, Rob, yeah. Uh, yes, well, I just uh, wanted to point there people's attention to maybe page six of the uh, packet here. I could share my screen maybe for the public and Sure. Well, since I have it right up here, uh, here we go. I think it's uh, it's pretty bad. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. I just think everyone should see this before we get to these questions. Uh, you know, and I'm looking at this, and uh, you know, I, maybe I would ask the um, seems like first individual that spoke uh, was construction savvy. You know, is there a risk of that uh, coming down and causing damage to the um, actual historic, uh, you know, porch, uh, you know, that would be a, a, certainly a concern of mine here, maybe not spelled out in our exemptions exactly, but uh, just wondering if uh, mm -hmm. that's a that's a risk here. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, Rick or Gary or Lori, welcome to answer. Uh, well, I think, yeah, um, you pointed that out well, it's, uh, yeah, it can collapse. Um, I don't expect it to collapse the next month, but uh, I don't think it's going to make it through the next winter. Um, and you can see the the uh, outer walls, uh, like I mentioned earlier, of the upper sleeping porch. It, it just wasn't built right, and and you can see it uh, wasn't attached to the building right. Uh, and yes, the uh, damage to the uh, original porch below would be most likely um catastrophic of course someone's below it when it falls <laughs> right very catastrophic yeah okay thanks thanks rob for pointing that out um and has it been that way since you bought the house or um how can you can you tell us about the um condition of the sleeping porch and how how it came to be so dis deteriorated or it what caused the deterioration I think it's gradual over time and weather and um, snow and ice damage. Would you say there's anything about the original design that made it less robust than it should have been to withstand the weather and snow and ice? That's out of our, that would be Rick, that's out of ours. <laughs> it's kind that of a big question, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know. I mean, we shovel the snow off the roof, yeah. but that portion of the roof is very difficult to get to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, like I mentioned, um, it just wasn't built correctly. It's not attached to the house correctly up at the top. And um, uh, you get a couple of tons of snow on that and then rain. Um, it'll slowly pull it away from um, away from the house, which is what's happening. Uh -huh. Undo weight uh -huh. on the rafter tails um, of the porch below. Um, so, yeah, it's it just wasn't number one. It wasn't a good idea, and number two, it wasn't built correctly. Okay. Okay, if it had been a bad idea built correctly, we'd be having a different conversation maybe, but <laughs> um, okay, thanks. That helps us um, kind of con consider um, whether maintenance has been an issue, which is something that we're supposed to ask about. Um, and part of what I'm hearing you say is that it's hard to maintain something that was built poorly. Exactly, yes, yes. Um, yeah, it just, um, yep. There's not much more I can say. It just wasn't built correctly and it wasn't a great idea to begin with. Okay, thanks. Um, so we've talked about your knowledge of the historical significance of the property and also the structural soundness of the building. Those are the two considerations Meredith suggested that we um, focus on. Um, I'll ask one more question then turn it over to others. Um, did you 
you know, construction's expensive. Um, we know, uh, did, did you look into what it would cost to rehabilitate it to a point where it could be a useful part of the house? Another thing that we sort of consider is the economic feasibility of rehabilitation of it. Well, you can ask uh, Rick, but I think it was not rehabilitatable. Yeah, my opinion would be um, it would probably be at least $40,000, uh, maybe $50,000 with the um, cost of building materials now to um, remove it 100% because there's, not, there's no value there right now. Um, you have to totally take it out, um, then build a new one uh, with decent windows and uh, and such. Um, yeah, at least forty thousand dollars, at least um, to rebuild it, um, and a, for a very uh, small fraction of that, a uh, fairly small fraction of that to. Um, return it to the way it was back in the good old days. Okay. And it's, I couldn't quite eyeball it, but we're talking about something that's you know, 10 feet by eight feet. Is it, it's pretty small, isn't it? That's correct. Good guess. Really? Yes. Great. <laughs> All right. Wow. We're on a roll. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you for that estimate on the fly. I realized I put you on the spot to talk about money. Thank you for doing it. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so um, I'm going to encourage DRB members to take a look at this list of criteria of um, considerations on page five of the staff report and uh, just open it up to questions from DRB members. You know, I mean, I think we got a pretty good track record of dealing with uh, you know, these similar ones, and uh, I think we've got the process down. And so, uh, I think, uh, yeah, great job in getting through it. Okay, well, thank you. I appreciate the conversation. I like to spend the time because we can't. It's hard to go backwards. Um, so, so I appreciate that. Um, okay, so before we before we move on or before I entertain a motion, does any does do any DRB members have any? need any additional information to make a decision about, about this application. Okay, um, if not, I'll entertain a motion to close the public hearing and or I'll, I'll back up. Um, you may have heard me say this once or twice already, but we do all of our deliberating in a closed deliberative session um, because of the sort of complications of the Zoom environment. It's not a reflection on, on your application. Um, so is there a motion to close the public hearing and go into deliberative session after the close of the public meeting? So moved. Motion by Jean. Is there a second? Second. Second by Abby. Thanks. I'll call the roll. Jean? Yes. Michael? Yes. Abby? Yes. Rob? Yes. And I vote yes as well. So we will we will consider this in a, in a closed session after this meeting is over. Um, you'll get a written decision uh, after as soon as possible after that. Um, but thank you very much for being here. Thanks for telling us about your project and helping us think it through. Um, and we'll be in touch as soon as we can. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Good night. Um, so what's next on the agenda? Um, other business? Other business. Thank you. Of course. So our next meeting is June 21st, two weeks from tonight. Um, do And do we expect to have here uh, applications, Meredith? Do you know? Yes. Yep, we'll have a okay. meeting. Very good. Okay. So what we do next, um, we will... Oh, yeah, Rob, go ahead. Well, I just don't know if it was last meeting or whatnot. We had talked about a brief conversation about uh, in-person meetings, um, maybe at this meeting or the next meeting. Uh, I don't know if you were headed there or not. I was not headed there. I wasn't at the last meeting. And I, um, maybe it was would, two would folks like ago. to talk? OK, no, it was, it was you're right. last meeting, Rob. Also, we also mentioned the last meeting. And, and so Meredith, what's, what's going on with the, as far as like the city? 
perspective. Yeah. Right. Do we have so, any updates? I don't really have an update, still pretty much the same status and that the city council is going back to in person meetings and Mike can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but last I heard they were going to be start doing that um, in July. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the other the the committees and boards that get appointed by the city council will be able to choose when they go back to full in person or do a hybrid version. Um, so if at the very least, once we hit July meetings, um, I would be no longer in my office, I would be upstairs in city council chambers so that the public can come in if they want to. Um, and we would have some sort of setup there, but we were thinking <laughs> that it might make sense to let the city council do some in person meetings first to work out any technological issues. Um, because I think that, you know, my thought was that we would still leave some form of Zoom capability for those people who, um, for one reason or another, can't make it into city council chambers, but still want to participate. Mm -hmm. um, that, that keeping that benefit, that, that really has been a benefit during this time. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really up to the board and other committees to choose how they want to do this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm agreeable to seeing how it goes with city council before coming back. I also agree that this is this approach has provided access that's important for people. Um, what do others, I, I, I'm not ready to say that on this date, I will be 100% comfortable being in a room. Um, with, with other folks. I just don't know. It's changing every day. But um, do others have any um, thoughts that they want to share about this? And you are not required to share your thoughts, but if you have any. I think that there is. I, think I will say we like... have other boards that, that, that have chosen to stay remote because they, they prefer this format. So. Hmm. One hundred percent remote. Yep. I mean, we'll have to go and still. We'll have to provide an option, as Meredith said. So, uh -huh. you know, for planning commission, I would have to be upstairs in the um, with a. We would, we would set up some computers up there for people to come in and have a remote access to a Zoom meeting. Uh -huh. um, but everybody else, from like the planning commission, is going to remain in the Zoom remote format. They don't want to go back to meeting in person. And I know there are a couple others that like that. Hmm. Okay. What were you gonna say, Abby? Um, I I think that there's potential challenges and like quality of meeting if there's half of the people are remote and the other half of the people are together. I don't know how to resolve that, but I know hmm. that that's um, in a lot of the return to work literature I'm reading. Mm -hmm. um, teams and organizations are are making choices to either be kind of all in person or all remote so that mm -hmm. there's more equi equal participation and access across mm -hmm. everybody. Mm -hmm. So I just I put that out there as just a, a factor. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that's that's one reason I was thinking we could wait and see how city council manages things, especially with yep. the technology. Um, you know, because there are there are groups of people, even if we're just looking at COVID specific, there are groups of people who can't get vaccinated and aren't going to feel comfortable being in a room with a lot of people, but we don't want to keep them from being able to participate in the process. Mm -hmm. um, and so having some sort of good flowing remote system for that, and it might mean that we need to have, you know, all the board members need to have screens at their spots in the round so that their their features can be seen and there mm -hmm. or there needs to be some way for the orca streaming to be part of the zoom we're not quite sure which is one reason i'm thinking we we will let city council work out some of those issues because they're going to have public participation the same way the board does even mm -hmm. if it's not for an application per se yeah mm -hmm. yeah 
And I would say in some ways our, our public participation is a little more intensive and interactive. It's less reporting or commentary and more engagement and sharing of documents. And I think the document sharing in this has been very valuable because when we're in that room, it's not like we have a projector where everyone in the audience can see. Um, and this is a very visual, this is very visual work that we do. Yep. And that's one of those things that I would like to try and keep. Um, and that mm -hmm. might be having a couple of different big screens, not the big projector screen, but an actual monitor screen um, that is logged in so that maybe myself and one or two other people mm -hmm. in the room have the ability to share their screens to that big screen. Um, to be able to share documents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it sounds like we don't need to make any decisions tonight. Is there, are there any other factors that DRB members want to make sure are considered? And there is a factor, I mean, so not everyone has, so it works vice versa too. Not everyone has access to this format. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there has to be a, we have to accommodate those groups or folks who don't have this capability of accessing Zoom or have mm -hmm. the yeah. Accessible, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jean. That's a, that's an important point too. Mm -hmm. Let's do like a standing check-in on this um, as, as we go along and see what, what there is. It may not be necessary next time, but um, certainly the time after that. Yep. Sounds good. All right. Great. So, um, Let's take five. Um, Meredith's going to send us, if she hasn't already, um, a link to the deliberative session Zoom. So please come back at 8.56. Do we need a oh, motion no. to adjourn to close the public, the public hearing? hearing? Yep. The public hearing. Yep. yep. But I wanted to say when we're coming back before we adjourn the meeting. <laughs> um, Rob, Rob, did you have a question? I was just going to say that um, make Meredith's comment. <laughs> okay. Do you have anything else to say instead? Perhaps a motion to adjourn into deliberative session? Close the public meeting and adjourn to the deliberative session. Motion by Rob. Is there a second? Second. Second by Jean. I'll call the roll. Jean. Yes. Michael. Yes. Abby. Yeah. Rob. Yes. And I vote yes. I will see you all at 8.56 in the deliberative session. Um, thanks to anyone who watched and thanks to everyone who participated. Good night.